let's start with you then, Graham. Now, are you all familiar with the Graham Strong recordings? In essence, you started watching Doctor Who as a boy and you started taping, didn't you? But then, then something particular happened and you, you made these extra special recordings. Can you remember what happened? I started watching Doctor Who from the very beginning um, and uh, I was using a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder with a microphone. Um, later on, I had a different tape recorder and we had a different TV. I was able to, um, with some knowledge of electronics as a teenager, uh, wire up directly the tape recorder to the TV and dispense with a microphone. So uh, I've ended up with what's been known as the crystal clear recordings. So th this, is, this is where we can bring in superb sound engineer Mo and Mark. Now, normally, if, if you were to just hang a microphone or put a microphone in front of a TV speaker in, in a lounge or, or wherever it was being recorded, what, what is, in essence, the, the, the problem with the recording versus the way Graham did it? Well, there are a number of problems. Um, I think it's very easy for us to sit here now. I think we need to get back a bit, but it's very easy for us to all sit here now where everything you know, comes down the internet. We download it down the internet on the computer, and there it is. Or even a few years ago, if you wanted to record something off the radio, you probably had a little box with a cassette machine built into your radio, and you just literally press play and record. Um, in, way back in, in the 60s, which when I was a kid as well, um, this technology didn't really exist. Even if you had a real to record, you might have a gramophone, perhaps, which would have a, a, a an output which you could put into a, a recorder. Um, but where televisions were concerned, it was just, this was absolutely not the case. Most televisions uh, back then were little square boxes with a little square screen and probably a speaker on the side, um, which was stuck in the corner of a room, so you couldn't really hear it anyway. Um, wasn't fantastic technology. Putting a microphone. Um, most of the microphones that um, we would have been able to record, uh, afford back then would have been probably crystal microphones, electric microphones, um, and they would be omnidirectional. Um, even if it was a dynamic microphone, it would be omnidirectional. So it would pick up not just everything. Now, this is, this is a directional microphone. Directional microphone, if I do that, you can hear me. Okay. Directional. Directional. Distance from my mouth. You can. Okay? Can hear me. That's a directional microphone. Back then, microphones weren't directional. Um, I could do that. Do the same. So if you put a microphone in front of a telly, like this, you'd hear fine. But it would also hear everything that was coming out of the back of the room. So you'd be recording not just your telly, but you'd be recording everything that was around including it. Including the family having their tea. Including the family having their tea, mum coming in saying, when does this programme finish? So I can say. Um, uh, so that, that was part of the problem. The other problem was, even if you had a dynamic microphone, and this is, a, this is an SM58, this is a dynamic microphone. Um, dynamic microphone has a magnet in it. And if you put it near a television speaker, uh, a television speaker, like any loudspeaker, also has a magnet in it. Um, back then, and this is technical, but back then um, televisions were valve televisions and they ran off mains voltage. Nowadays a television, although you plug a mains into the back of it, it probably runs off about 5 volts, 5 to 15 volts, because it's a little transport which drives all the transistors. Back then, mains voltage went around all the television. So every part of the television had 250 volts AC on it and they included the loudspeaker. That meant that it also had mains uh, frequency. If you put a dynamic microphone like this in front of the television, not only were you picking up the rest of the room, you also had the speaker microphone reacting directly with the microphone here again, all the way through, picking up the main time. Even though you couldn't hear it, it would interact and you'd pick that on your recordings as well. So you were really on absolute hiding to nothing. So what Graham did, and Graham was very clever, and I have to say I was just as clever, I did exactly the same thing, but what you did, you did a modification to your telly which enabled you to record out the back. And what I had to do was, because there was mains voltage on the back of the volume control on my telly as well, probably on yours as well, um, I built a transformer which tapped into that, which took the mains voltage down to the five volts I could feed to my tape recorder through a little transistor preamp, and then came out with a socket on the back of the telly. So that bypassed always putting a microphone in front of it. 
it was very dangerous because if you took back on telly and touched anything in there, you could kill yourself. When my black and white telly that I'd done the modification to went wrong, my dad took it to be repaired. And the repair guy said, who's done the modification? My dad said, my son. And he said, well, he's very clever, but I'm not giving you a receipt for this repair. Because if I give you a receipt for this repair, I'm endorsing yeah. this modification. You know, it's very clever, very dangerous. So that was the problem. So you know what Graham did was brilliant. He tapped into the telly. It's what I did in the mid-70s, 10 years too late. Um, but that's the way we did it. So why didn't you record Doctor Who as well? Then? Because when I did my well, I did my modification when I was 14, which was in 2013. Uh, 2013. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking very good on it. It's been a long life. Um, uh, in um, yeah, 1973, no, 1974, when I was 13. Um, so I did, but you know I was 10 years too late to get the recordings you got. So Graham, you took this decision. And we are so grateful for you for doing this that you would record them as line recordings. And this is why your recordings became so special. The other thing that was so special about them was that previously you just recorded them and wiped them and recorded them and wiped them. But then there came, when you had this option to keep them as line recordings, you actually saved the tapes, didn't you? Yes, that's right. Well, to start with, I was, uh, I was still at school. So I was relying on just uh, pocket money and um, probably only had one or two tapes that I would uh, reuse over, over and over again. So um, although I might have well recorded from the very beginning, they, they got overridden with later episodes. Um, it wasn't until 1965 when, as I say, we had a different TV and a, a different tape recorder um, and I'd uh, experimented with electronics uh, to the point of being able to connect up directly to the TV, that um, the quality is obviously a lot better, and I felt then that uh, I could keep them, particularly also I was working, so I uh, was able to purchase more tapes. So you actually started, because I know, I know so much about your recordings, because it was a bizarre set of circumstances, but we met at a party about 25 years ago, and we were the, oh, you're the two people who, who like Doctor Who, why don't you have a chat? Now back then, I knew about Doctor Who audio recordings because some had been released, I think there was Tomb of the Cybermen that had come out, Fury from the Deep had come out, and, and when I bought them and heard them, I thought, hang on a minute, they, they're not really that clear. And when Graham said to me, oh, I used to record Doctor Who back in the 60s, my little ears pricked up, and when you said you did them as line recordings, I remember you being very dismissive about them, going, but I recorded them at a moderately low speed, and they're mono, and the tapes are old, and they're probably not that good. But I came round your house, and I remember you lacing up these tapes that you still kept, and we played some, didn't we? And you had pretty much most things from the Dalek Master Plan Part 8 right through to the end of the Dominators. I used the slow speed because that was a way of... Uh, Making the tape last three times a Making the exactly, yeah. yes. And uh, by then I got a four track tape recorder, so you could actually get four recordings uh, on one tape, each one probably an hour and a half, two hours long. Um, and so by using the slow speed over four tapes, I had way over 100, you probably know the exact number, Steve. Yeah, well it, it was something like 110 okay. episodes. Right. So when I actually heard these, it was quite a revelation because these were so clear for their age. In fact, the first thing we did, I remember, was looking for, we went through and found the Abominable Snowman Part 2 because I'd seen that because it was on BSB about a year previously. And Mark knows all about this, but there's a chunk of about 10 seconds that has no sound that's missing completely. And I thought, Oh, what a shame, the film was an editing fault, it was a fault on the edit. And my, my first question to Graham was, oh, I want to know whether that went out like that. And we found it, and it did. How on earth that never got passed? Anyway, so you made these, rec these fantastic recordings. You'd actually contacted the BBC prior to meeting me, hadn't you, about them, because you, you wondered whether they were going to be of any use. <laughs> Yes, I, I was watching a, a VHS tape, if anyone remembers what those things are, um, rented from Blockbuster, 
Um, and at the very end of the story was um, John Nathan Turner saying, uh, we're, we're basically looking for new material, and if you have anything, to contact the BBC, uh, which I did. And um, basically the answer came back, uh, we're only looking for video, if you've only got audio, sorry pal, not interested. But of course we were interested, and I knew how special these recordings were. So what we did then, we actually managed to make safety dubs of all your recordings, didn't we? We, we made a recording onto the hi-fi track of VHS, which was about the best that we had at the time. And I made a compilation tape, a clip of perhaps a minute of each story. And we went up to London, didn't we, Graham? This was in the early 90s, up to the Fitzroy Tavern, which I've never actually been to before, but I knew it was this mecca of, of really influential Doctor Who fans. And I remember handing the tape to Gary Russell. I took up a little personal cassette player, and we actually played it, and he was blown away. He said it sounded like a Radio 4 drama instead of just a distant microphone recording. And so I handed him this tape with, with our contact details on, and, and that was it. And then a few months later, we had a few phone calls. And happily, the long and short of it is that those recordings were returned to the BBC. You uh, went to Paul, didn't you? And yes. They went to Paul, and Paul uh, took the tapes up to BBC Birmingham and made uh, digital copies of them all. Yes. And, then, um, and those tapes are now in my studio, because we use that as the... Um, those are your, the masters. As, as the masters. Have any of you heard the, the recordings? They've been released on CD, things like that, or any, anything really, from the massacre right through. Yeah. And they are, they are astoundingly good. There were, however, a few problems with them, Graham, weren't there? I remember when we went through them tape by tape, you suffered a, a, occasionally with things like co-channel interference, all these things we don't really get anymore. And also, you said when we were listening to one of the episodes, oh look, a car's just gone by with an unsuppressed alternator or something like that. <laughs> you could hear this strange interference. Well, back in those days, uh, cars um, weren't suppressed as much as they are now. And uh, if, if a car went by that was uh, not well suppressed, then you could hear this uh, clicking sound on the audio, and it just came through. It, it, the TV transmission wasn't capable of actually suppressing it. And television was only VHF then. It, 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 was, right. it, was, it was fairly um, low frequency transmission. I mean, digital television now is way up in the stratosphere, the frequency that's transmitted on. But back then it wasn't. Um, so it wasn't the same frequency as your car engine was ticking over. Um, that kind of thing. So it would pick up electromagnetic interference from, from all over the place. And the co-channel interference, uh, where, I, where I lived at the time, which was down in Devon near Exeter, and uh, in the summer we used to get a lot of problem with um, French TV transmitters interfering with our English TV transmitter, and, and this would give uh, a very severe fading effect with distortion, which Mark probably knows all about because he's tried to remove them. Well, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so in my job, in you know, as I said earlier, you know, when I first became aware, uh, like you, of, of the audio books that were being released, you know, I realised that you know, they weren't obviously the source tapes weren't that great, but also there was a lot more work that could have been done on them to make them sound a lot better. Um, but you know, there's the um, uh, you know the computer expression, you know, garbage in, garbage out, and that's true. You know, the, the better source you start with. One of the things that we restoration team brought to, you know, a hope brought to Doctor Who was not just um, rigorous technical standards, but also knowing where the best quality sources were. So of course when we found Graham's tapes and they were best quality um, off-air source, it makes your job an awful lot easier. Uh, because what you really want to do is take off the top layer of dirt and garbage to try and get back to what the original was as close as possible. Um, so Graham's uh, recordings, which were direct line recordings. Um, the, the other advantage of this, when we think about it, in the 60s, most of, well, all, all the episodes from the 60s that survive are on film recordings. Um, so the sound has been squashed down to film. So rather than being, a, uh, I mean, 60s television is actually extremely high quality, this, this sound recording. Um, if you listen to one of the surviving uh, mag episodes, like the William Space episode, the sound quality is extraordinarily high quality, but once it goes down to 16 millimeter film, it's really squashed. What Graham's recordings are, of course, actually recordings off the original broadcast two-inch tapes. 
because that's what they were transmitted from. So um, you, you, you trade one thing from another. You know, on a film recording, you lose quality because it's gone to a film recording. On grams tapes, you lose a bit of quality because it's been transmitted and recorded at low speed. But in fact, the trade-off is pretty equal. So in fact, it's fair to say, isn't it, that even though Graham's recordings are there, and we might think, well, I've already got that episode, therefore they are of no use. There's actually two reasons where they have been useful. One is that the recording quality of Graham's is superior to a surviving print. And I think I was chatting to you earlier, wasn't it? Can I? Be, yeah. Not, yeah. not in all cases, but is it right that, for example, the Web of Fear, I seem to remember that actually parts <laughs> five and six, you're, you're watching the film print, but you're listening to Graham's recording. I can't remember the exact thing, but certainly, certainly quite a few, that's, that's very probably the case. I mean, there are a number of occasions where, as I think I said just now, the trade-off between the 60 mil and the off-air is often very, very close. Um, I mean, the best recordings, I mean, there, there are other people who recorded. I mean, all all of Tenth Planet, for instance, is not David's recording, uh, not Graham's recording, it's David Holman's recording. But that was better than the 60 mil by a long chalk. And I certainly had used Graham's recordings. I think you're right on those on those episodes. But you're, yes, you're actually listening to off-air recording, not to the 60 mil film. And the other the other thing as well, I imagine, where these recordings are useful is where there have been edits where you can actually line up an off-air transmission with a film print. And you've, we've, uh, I remember Peter Crocker saying that sometimes there are little <coughs> short chunks missing, even yeah. if it's a few frames. Yeah, we, we do that um, on, on all... We, we made it... You know, once we started getting these recordings, um, we, we made it a um, part of our workflow that we would compare the preserved print, whatever it was, with the off-air recording, because that way we could work out whether any had been lost um, in you know center cuts or whatever and we did occasionally find something that you know was, was, was missing it also helped um, with the war machines which the only print we've got of these episode three um, there's the big battle between the war machines most of that was excised by the Australian censors it's only that print that we have so we were able to rebuild that um, with reference to your audio we used the, we used the audio to make a complete soundtrack and then Peter went in and made up the Filled pictures. Filled in the pieces of the yeah. 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 So the pictures are fake, but the audio is original. So, with, with your recordings then, Graham, can you remember going back to the 60s, what your routine would be, your, your Saturday evening? Because I can't imagine, at the age you would have been, my parents would have gone absolutely mental if I meddled with the TV, but also commandeered the TV. I remember sometimes just missing Doctor Who because they wanted to watch something else. There were only two channels back then. Yeah. Well, no argument about no going to watch Sky Atlantic or ITV or um, Living or... I think certainly within 1963 uh, up to 65 when they started, um, we didn't have BBC Two then, did we? So you've only got two channels to choose from. And uh, lucky or not, we, we had a situation where the TV was in a room that we didn't normally use. It, uh, we had what was called the sitting room, as uh, Mark has referred to it before. The sitting room had the TV. And uh, if mum was in the, uh, in the kitchen, or the kitchen diner, as you would call it now, then, you know, she was given instructions not to come in on recording. So you started recording at... Dalek Master Plan Part 8, which is the first one after the Christmas Day episode, and you pretty methodically went all the way through. But there were two four-part stories that were absent from your recordings, which were The Gunfighters and The Celestial Toymaker. Can you remember what happened there? Did you record them and then decide to dump them, or did you just not like the look of them? Or Well, there's another remember? episode as well of the, um, the Feast of Stephen. Um, that one I didn't record. That was just before you started recording, so that would have been the last one that you didn't record, as it were. Ah, uh, yeah, there was actually a Dalek Master Plan I was 11, I think. I started number 8. Yes, yeah, I think you were 8, 9, 10 and 12. So there was I, another one you missed. I don't know whether I didn't record the Feast of Stephen. I know it was a Christmas Day special, I believe. Or yes, it was Christmas Day. I think, you I think you started recording full time and keeping with the following episode. After Feast of Stephen. But there were, there were there, yes, there, there was, there was Dalek Master Plan 11 missing, and then two complete stories that you didn't record. Can you remember? One of them was the Celestial Toy Maker that we've now got part four of. The other well, one is the Gunfighters, which is actually complete. Yes, the Gunfighters and the Toy Maker were, were both a situation. I was recording this to, to play them back later for my own pleasure. 
and um, both of those stories, there was more sort of less less dialogue, shall we say, and, and more sort of background noise and fighting and things. And um, I think at the end of the day, I, I decided that there if I'm going to listening. if I'm going to listen to this, I'm not going to understand what's going on. You did? Did you record Space Pirates? You didn't record that one either. No, you, you ended up, you finished up. Oh, dominated is the last one. Yes. Yeah, I know I cursed you for not recording the Space Pirates. No. I don't that don't think the survivor, all the survivor recording the <laughs> Space Pirates are absolutely dying. So, I, yeah, I mean, I'm just so indebted to Graham, and I'm sure you all are as well. And there are other people who did make recordings, so Graham is not alone in this. There is another thing you used to do with the Hartnell stories. You recorded all of the opening music and all of the closing music, and then you started again. But that went wrong, didn't it, at the end of the Tenth Planet? Yes, I would blame the BBC for that one. Um, the, the reason I didn't record the opening and closing credits together was that the tape wasn't long enough to record, was it 25 minutes or 25 minutes? 25 minute episodes. Um, so the only way I could get around it was to cut short most of one of the credits. So I decided to uh, keep the opening credits and cut the closing credits. Um, this all went pear-shaped uh, for the, the tape with um, Tenth Planet on. Yeah, because yeah, up till then, when I listened back to Graham's recordings, all of them, Hartnell's, were, had the, the top and tails there, until the Tenth Planet, when it must have been an extraordinarily nerve-wracking moment, watching the reel run out, and it actually ran out about one second after the blue peat clip that survives of the regeneration kicks in. Uh, so we have still... just by a whisker got the last second. I can, I can remember that thing very well. Yeah. <laughs> and from Power of the Daleks onwards, <laughs> it's opening credits only. What, watching the tape get smaller and smaller to the point, oh my goodness, it's going to cut. <laughs> Now going on to the, when you started chopping the end, and going on to the, the new Patrick Trout era with Power of the Daleks, what I wanted to just say is, Mark, how on earth do you go from a quarter inch reel mono recording that Graham made of that story and turn it into a 5.1 surround sound? Fantastic version. I think, have you, you must, it is a bit of a stupid question here, you must all have seen and heard the new DVD and Blu ray release of Power of the Daleks. A lot of people won't put this around me. Yeah, if, if you do get the chance to listen to it, there is a 5.1 surround sound mix which this genius has created. And Mark, how on earth do you do that? I mean, the, what, how, how do you... I get up very early and I go to bed very late. Yeah. But you used, you had a DAT recording of Graham's tape, that's all you had to go by, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, there was a, a DAT recording of Graham's. Um, um, it was, Power of the Dark was always a story which I thought might quite work, work quite well in 5.1. I mean, I, I love surround sound. I do everything I do in surround sound if I possibly can. Um, but Power of the Daleks, it's a very moody story. You know, when, it, when um, Tristram Carey's music comes in, you know, it's, it's, it's got fantastic atmosphere to it. And I do have Tristram's music tapes. Um, Tristram sent me a of his music many years ago before he died. Um, so I did have that, so I thought it was, it was worth a go. Um, so yes, I started to get my grand tapes, um, clean those up, you know, if you get the DVD or the Blu-ray, you know, there is a, a straight restored version of the mono sound on there. But I thought it would be fun to, um, to, uh, to try and do something else with it. So that was just a question of, you know, that's, that's my sound, that's my mono sound, but that's going to go in the middle, that's going to be the dialogue, which is where the dialogue goes to 5.1, but everything else I've sort of stripped off it as best as I could. Um, and then rebuild it in surround sound. Um, so yes, it, I mean, the, when you're doing a surround mix of most things, um, the dialogue, you have the raw dialogue which is recorded in the studio, which is edited, and that's so that you have. Um, and then you have the music, and then you have the sound effects. You can rebuild it as a surround mix in exactly the same way as they would have built it in the mono mix. Um, but that's later Doctor Who's or later films when they when they do things in that order, and you know, just record things, then they edit it, and then they put the music and the sound on. Back then, it was all um, played in live. It was all it? played in live, and basically the show was made in camera on the studio floor. So the instant music and the effects were all played in. So what went down on, on the master tape, the mono mix, is what got transmitted. So there was nothing to nothing to to rebuild from elements. But no, I did I did have um, all the music, so I was able to 
very carefully filter most of the music out of the mono mix. So I was just left with the centre of the dialogue, and then I could rebuild the music around it and surround from the original tapes I had from Tristram. Um, a lot of the effects on power we don't have, but what I can go, what I can do is go through and again very carefully these days um, removing the dialogue. And so I'm just left with the effects. I can re then rebuild the effects. So that's just. Um, very complicated jigsaw. It's very, it, it, you, you, you watch a really good magician doing a magic trick, and you know it's a magic trick, but you can't see how they did it. My job is to do the same with audio. My job is to sort of perform slides of ear. It's all very, very clever stuff. Kind of stuff. And, so you said it's it's, hopefully you can't hear how I've done it, but it's, it's all a magic trick. And can you remember any other challenges trying to restore old audio, for example, Graham's tapes, even though they are very, very good, there were issues with some of them? Well, you know, as, as we've said, you know, Graham's stopped recording the opening closing titles, so it's rebuilding those. Um, so making sure that I replace, I mean, I replace the opening and closing music on the restorations anyway. But if you don't have the original recording to refer to, you can't <coughs> really send exactly what you said start to finish. So, so that, that's a challenge. You had one situation where you, you contacted me and said, uh, was there a baby crying in the background? Yes, and in fact, <coughs> that's Power of the Daleks. Power of the Daleks. It was when I contacted you and said, is that a baby crying? And you said, no, it wouldn't have been a baby crying. Right. Right. <laughs> so I left it in. And it's just as well I left it in, because of course we now know, having done the reconstruction now, that it is actually a baby crying. Yes, and then on, on, on the Power of the Daleks. Running away from the Daleks. So there's all sorts of things like that, you know. And, and that again is the trick of restoration, is actually doing your research and trying to work out. I mean, I, sometimes the software gets a little bit, then sometimes I leave the automatic software to do something. Most of the time, I, mean, I, I do this by pretty much by hand, but sometimes I put a bit of software on it, and there's, I think it was Jan Vincent Bruski um, emailed me and said, oh, two of the side men with Jamie on Darcy's jacket, the Velcro sound is missing. Oh, right. On the first DVD release, that's what you went, and the software thought that was a nasty noise. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I put that back in again later. Um, so, you know, occasionally we make mistakes, but it is a question of doing your research, doing your research and trying not to make mistakes. You, you... There was one episode, Steve, where um, I remember there was a break in transmission. Is that the one you mentioned earlier? There was, um, you, you recorded Evil of the Daleks, and then you recorded Evil of the Daleks again when it was repeated, and there was a transmission breakdown, but I don't think you, I think you must have paused that out. Okay, I paused the most of it out. Uh, I don't know what the problem, I can't remember. The and that, that followed the wheel in space, and that was really coming to the end of when you were recording. You made one more recording, which was the Dominators, and then you stopped. Can you remember why? Did you just fall out of love with Doctor Who? Because you missed pretty much all of season six, which as Mark said, it would have been so handy to have the Space Pirates and actually an intact copy of The Invasion. Because, uh, uh, can yeah. I go back in the TARDIS and redo them? <laughs> yeah. Can you remember what happened? Well, I, I think I'd come to the end of my fourth tape and uh, perhaps realised that um, I, I wasn't listening to these as much as I used to and what is the point in carrying on? Um, partly also, I, I wasn't so interested with uh, trope and stories as I was with Hartnell. Um, and uh, the, the two together just sort of came to an end of a tape and I think that's a decision to stop or, or do I do another whole tape? Well. Shame you didn't carry on, but all I can say is just thank you so much for making those recordings.